Nerds, this is Tina Nerd. I'm your host, Sarah Belmont, and with me, as always, is our Mr. Producer, Will Paul. How are you doing tonight, Will? I'm doing very well, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm doing great, but I really want to talk a show tonight, so we're going to do this really quickly. You're doing great. I'm great. Yep. Patricia, you're here, too. All right. Everybody's great. <laughs> 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 Welcome, back. Show. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Well time. Well, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back and talking with you guys. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think we are all three very excited to talk something. So let's just jump right into it. Yeah, because there's a new show. There's a new crew in town, if you may. Uh, Cloak and Dagger debuted this week, and this show. At least I have been anticipating for since at least last fall. I feel like that's when I first started hearing about it. I don't know about you both. Um, but they dropped, they did the clever thing. I'm really happy about this series because they did the smart thing and they dropped the first two episodes mm-hmm. in one night, uh, which was very pleasing because I always, and I think I've said it on this show before, like, Pilot episodes drive me crazy because it's just an expansion or an extended version of the trailer that you receive when you first see footage. So I really liked how you not only got that prologue to the series in the pilot episode, but you also got the second episode to show you the potential and what kind of narratives they're going to be playing with um, over the course of the 10 episodes that they're currently slated for. Patricia, what were your first thoughts about Cloak and Dagger episodes one and two? Well, I really liked, well, going back to your original question is I hadn't really heard anything except for the name of it, like floating around here and there. And so I came into it without having seen any of the trailers or read anything about it. Um, but going into it, I was, like, well, who knows what this is going to be about. So here we go. Um, I, when I first started it, it just sucked me right in. And I typically have a hard time sitting down for a long period of time to watch something unless I'm super into it and I know I'm going to be into it. And this just took me right into it. And I really enjoyed the filming the different views and camera viewpoints that they had. I like that they started off when they were kids and they gave us that tiny bit of backstory at the beginning and then sort of brought them to the present day. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I just like how the story unfolded slowly. It's like, and, and going from episode one to episode two, as they're trying to discover or figure out what's going on with them. They're just as much in the dark as you are right. as the viewer yeah. trying to figure it out. And I loved that because I, I'm frustrated just as much as they're frustrated trying to figure out what the heck is going on with them. And so I'm ready for episode three whenever it's going to come out. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> next, next, next Thursday night, 8 Eastern. Uh, Time Sunday zones are not our friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, but uh, my point in t- saying that is, uh, yeah. Uh, so, what were your thoughts, Will? Yeah. Initial reactions. Initial reactions. So, um, I've been familiar with the uh, with Cloak and Dagger just from from the comic books. From uh, wasn't one I really you know got into, but uh, just sort of knew it was out there. Uh, as far as the series itself, I think I had heard about it, and I think you and I have talked about it some. Maybe last year, mm-hmm. um, I think around around the time we were discussing *The Gifted*, another another Marvel show. Um, but uh, yeah, I I really really enjoyed it because uh, a, a couple things. One, like as Patricia said, how they just the way they just un- introduced the characters, them in their childhood, um, really setting up you know their their backstories as far as just trauma. That is going to, you know, eventually push, push them together in, in their current state. And, but also just introducing, like, how her, her mother, you know, 
Tandy's mother was, you know, unreliable. And, and then as far as uh, Tyrone, uh, hit, you know, really building on that guilt, what happens to his brother. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, especially as they're, you know, as that anger, as they were playing the basketball game and, and, you know, he was, you know, getting constantly like, you know, fouled and just, you know, taunted by, by the other kids and just getting to, to lose his cool. And as a sort of theme, theme that was starting to just sort of flow throughout, uh, the first two episodes, just that, that anger that, uh, that Tyrone has and, uh, and just all the symbolism too. And, and another thing that I liked about this show is they took it out of New York. It's actually in New Orleans. <laughs> and, yeah. and so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost, in many ways, the fresh start for, for our Marvel shows that typically always happen are very, very New York centered. You know, I think that's a good thing about the, the gifted too, just to bring up another Marvel show. It's in Atlanta. You know, not everything's always just always in New York, even though in the comic book, the characters are based out of New York, but, uh, that was a good move on the, uh, creator's part to, uh, differentiate the show from some of the other things. Right, exactly. Um, I I agree with you both. I I like the the flashback storytelling that took place because it you we're continue we continue to remain in the dark as to what really happened that night because they're not giving you the full story in the first episode. They're giving you just enough to to indicate how the characters you're meeting in present day. Uh, became who they are because of the events on that night. And, um, just also just how cute is little Tyrone? Like, yeah. baby Tyrone is the cutest thing. Like, when they show him with the, with the cloak walking down the street, I'm just like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I, he is amazing. <laughs> I was sold instantly. Yeah. It, and so, after watching the episodes, I got really curious to know more about these characters and where they came come from. And it was interesting to discover that the writers of the show made a lot of changes to the origins of these characters for yeah. the better, I would argue. Yeah. Even though retrospectively, the the uh, child versions of these characters actually do resemble a lot of what's in the books. I mean, with Tandy, you have the neglectful father you have the the absentee mom who they do a very good job about foreshadowing how her pill addiction came prior to the loss of her husband and just kind of got got more enhanced due to her grief and how she was dealing with that yep. um and it was also she comes from the rich she comes from high society and all of that that was taken away from her and on the flip side, you have Tyrone, who is caught stealing something because he wants to be like his brother. He wants to he 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 has this um this idea of how he can relate to these guys that are so much older than him um, mm -hmm. and and try to fit in in that weird way. I have younger brothers and older brothers, so I see that dynamic a lot where. Often the little boy feels like he has to prove himself to the older boys and a whole thing. And and how then, like you were saying, well, that survival guilt really manifests itself um, due to the events of that night where yeah. he becomes this angry teenager who's also because of his parents li living and shrouded in fear yeah. um, because of how one little mistake um, caused him to lose his brother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to your point about them changing their, their backs. Well, keeping the, the powers of their backstory the same and keeping yes. this and keeping they kept elements. They took elements of it because in the comic book, Tandy and Tyrone actually meet when they're actually they're already teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm glad they took it. I'm glad for, for this show to work, they made the right decision because making them kids and experiencing the traumatic events and the change that they made with Tyrone's backstory is in the in the comic book, Tyrone's Billy is actually his best friend, not his brother. Mm -hmm. um, and uh but you know this but the 
similarities are the same. I mean, basically, the, there is a corrupt cop who ends up killing Billy in the comic as well. Um, but you know, that being said, uh, it, making them, um, you know, making these changes to the characters, from, you know, being teenagers to you know, children who experiences these these traumatic events, um, keeping a version of the, of the runaway kid with in particular with Tandy. You know, Tandy basically lives in a church. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. her, and, you know, and sort of pops in on her mom's house whenever she needs to, you know, get the, you know, get the little pink bag. Uh, but, um, you know, those were, again, I think all good structural things that, um, you know, at, at its core to show is you know, a teen melodrama but the melodrama is, is, is not as um to take it you know compared to what what our error shows with flash you know you have that melodrama and all the stuff that goes on there but after a while it gets very emotionally draining and this i feel they've done a good balance so far of uh, yes you have that teen angst and drama going on but at the same time not always just you know in your face about it or you know there's other things larger things going on in their in their community that um you know that they, they touch on like racism and, and, and drug addiction and other things but it, it you know but uh in, in a very real kind of way sort of like right yeah 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 we're gonna get um before we started recording, I watched a few interviews with the showrunner, and apparently in episode four, there's a big conversation between Tyrone and Tandy about entitlement that yeah. I can't wait to see. Oh, yeah. Um, because they, it's been made clear to me that this show is not going to be fearful of attacking those issues and yeah. trying to sell it through these characters and and really ground this universe while a lot of the the abilities are shown and and like you brought up before the backdrop of New Orleans that's mm-hmm. a that's a place that's been through a lot of trauma itself yeah. and has a lot of history there a lot of mysticalism a part of it that um that I I I think is going to help incorporate itself into this world i mean for example and i didn't realize this but this is really interesting so they're both as kids when they fall into the water and they get stuck in the water and that rocks in um blows up that machine blows up that oil drill mm-hmm. that's um an, an an homage to deep water horizon yep yep <laughs> yeah i mean that's yeah. And then the storm happens. Katrina. Uh, Hurricane <laughs> Katrina, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Patricia, oh, what, yeah, what, what, are you, what, are, what are your, some of your thoughts as far as, you know, some of the things they've been touching on, uh, beyond just the, the construct of the, of the characters, I mean, as far as the atmosphere and things of the show? The, the characters as kids have gone through traumas. That's evident. But, that forced them to grow up and be more adult as at a younger age. And so we're seeing them as teenagers deal with these adult sort of feelings and thoughts and ideas and, you know, needing to make certain decisions. Like, I don't think we've seen, like, Tandy doesn't go to school. All she does is run around and try to jack people with money to try to be able to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and because of, that going on with the kids, it makes it feel like more of an adult and much more mature show. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I like it so much because it's not like, yes, it is about teenagers and them finding themselves. But at the same time, it's such from such an adult view, it makes it so much more relatable to an adult viewer mm-hmm. watching the show. And so I, I find that really refreshing in a, with having younger kids in, involved in a television show, I guess. Right. I shouldn't say they're yeah. your kids, but. 
Also, I want to say I really enjoyed um, the woman detective character Mm -hmm. because she was silent until her line at the end of episode two. Yep. 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 You have the right to remain silent, but she's been (laughs) silent the entire time. I thought that was very cool writing on their part. So. Yeah, yeah, th- and that was done deliberately. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> they, they made that, and they also made the choice to have the other police officer, as she's staking out the place, stop by and give her coffee with his number written on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they wanted to switch up, and and apparently they're going to do this moving forward with these two characters who we know literally nothing about. Um is try to, they've reversed the roles of the stereotypical female police officer and the stereotypical male police officer. So a lot of the things that he's going to be doing whenever he pops up is going to kind of indicate how ridiculous those old um, stereotypes are and what they used to show in TV. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you guys were really quiet there for a moment. No, no, you, I was just, you were, you were just like dropping so much knowledge. I was just soaking it all in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the other thing that I love about the characters is that typically you see the girl being the privileged one throughout mm-hmm. and exactly. constantly privileged exactly. and yeah. Tyrone. Yeah. Anyway, you get where I'm going with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm oh, just yeah. waiting for you to finish it because that's like <laughs> one of the biggest things to come out of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I was just thinking earlier back to your comment about you were saying the showrunners were going to touch on privilege in future episodes. And, um, yeah, but, you know, remember Tandy actually, you know, she did start off in, in a, pri- a position of, of, of wealth and where her father was, you know, they had a nice suburb, you know, suburban home when you saw the, you know, the rocks on it, agents going through and, you know, blowing up her life, um, after, after the, after the, uh, oil rig explosion, um, and, and just sort of seeing how, where she ends up and, then obviously Tyrone's story where his family, um, is the, you know, nice middle class family and, you know, even though they, they had the traumatic incident with his, with his brother, um, still manage to, to hold on and not lose everything. Yeah. So a few things about Tandy that I think we just keep circling around is that I really like Tyrone's perspective on her desire to, or her um, stealing things from others. And that idea that she had something taken from her mm-hmm. and now she's, not only trying to take that back, but trying to get her own sense of vengeance because she really feels like the world was taken away from her and her innocence in that moment. Um, and at that time to experiencing that and having both of your parents as through the aftermath um, disappear and that whole construct of a family just just completely disappear and be taken away from her like that is such a um, hardship for one to endure. And I really, I think that's interesting. And I think it's, um, I think her character, um, she is Dagger, who is a character of light and a character of hope. Mm -hmm. And I like that remark that I think her mom has at one point um, in one of the more, not flashbacks, but visions Mm -hmm. where her mom says like at that age, she was all hopeful. Like Tandy as a little girl had the, had her whole future ahead of her. Like everything was bright. Everything was shiny. And yet the storm hit and now everything is dark and her, her whole attitude is to run and to, and to not allow anyone else to take anything else away from her. And I think that's why at the end of episode two, she runs away. And and you guys know me. I love a female character with commitment issues. <laughs> <laughs> and that's handy. <laughs> but uh, speaking about the visions, like, 
you, I was very confused about the visions because I wasn't sure why and how they're connected to the powers and I'm still not. But I think it's very interesting how a lot of Tandy's visions are, are more dreamlike and, and hopeful and what could be or what possibly was from her perspective an idealistic while Tyrone his visions are more of a nightmare like that experience with him and his mom and when she loses both boys in the grocery store oh yeah that was just yeah yeah my parents lost me in the grocery store all the time (laughs) (laughs) it never ended like that But that vision also is aligned with her very powerful moment, I think, in the pilot where she delivers that line. I'm just afraid that you're going to do everything right and I'm still going to lose you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like of their visions, I think they're more of what's what memory the person that they're touching is experiencing or thinking about in that moment. At least but it's my the grocery store wasn't a memory. No, but I think like, but it could have been a bad dream that the mom has had, a recurring bad dream. Right. And she thought about that dream at that moment, the thought of losing her kids and having that nightmare constantly yeah. and playing it in her head. Yeah. That's, Got it. Yeah. I mean that that, that yeah, you're right, Patricia. I mean that theme of loss that you know, early, remember in episode one, whenever he, uh, when he was out late at the party and, you know, came home and, you know, she smelled alcohol in his leather jacket and stuff. And again, you know, she's already lost one child and, you know, he, you know Tyrone, like, you know, tells him, look back off, you're hovering that, I need space. And so, yeah, that, that sense of loss is there. But I mean, they're both, I mean, I guess essentially they're both empaths in that regard. Yeah. Empaths. That's a strong word. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I think that's what their powers are because, you know, but also I think it is that, like, you know, the contrast to light and dark, even though, uh-huh. uh, even though, you know, they're kind of flipping it, you know, you know like, again, it's just, it is that, that visual thing because, you know, I mean, it is the, the, the you know, cloak, I mean, dagger, she is the, the light. You know the, the 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 white mystical figure. I mean, and it, it is you know dark and you know it's, it's again all the symbolism and visions that they have. Even though you know superficially they're that way, but right. then when you look at the actual their actual home lives and their and their it's the exact opposite. I mean, she actually has relatively a darker life because she you know she's just literally. Making it from job, job to job as far as when they rob people. Um, you know, she's, you know, basically self-medicating to get her, you know, to make her way through the day. Um, whereas Tyrone has, you know, all the trappings of a quote unquote normal life, you know, absent his, you know, brother's killing, but you know, he's in a nice Catholic prep school. He's a, you know, basketball star, relatively popular kid in, in school. So, so even though superficially you would think, oh, She's white female. She's got it all going on. You know, black male. You know, think dark things and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it's actually different how and how their lives actually are. Yeah, they're there's they're doing great things with duality yeah. in this show, and I think it's smart. And I think it's fascinating also to consider that we've received two episodes, two full episodes, and I think the first one is actually even an additional half hour. 20 minutes and and yet and we have two leads who share what like five minutes of screen time together (laughs) (laughs) the which which does such a praise for the writers because I cannot wait for the episodes where those two are constantly interacting because that's what I want and I know that right now it's necessary for them to establish um, these characters independent of one another. And yet at the same time, there is this pool you feel like anytime they refer to that night and what happened on the beach. And 
you you just you know that there's something else going on. Like I, I love this idea of fate. Mm-hmm. And um Will, what I wanted to bring up is we we talked about this a little bit with Krypton mm-hmm. and how I wasn't a big fan of what they were doing with Light and Seg because in the first episode you're led to believe that those two have had this long relationship that we as viewers never got to experience. Right. Meanwhile, on with Cloak and Dagger, in the first episode, you see the traumatic event that they both experienced together and separately. Mm-hmm. And and how they they gone their separate ways only to be reunited. And yet there's still so much time lost yeah. that they we're going to we're going to learn about them as they learn about each other. And that's so much more fascinating to watch as a viewer who are supposed to believe in this relationship to be a really faded Romeo and Juliet type deal. Totally. Totally. I I was just thinking that very thing as as we finished up, we finished episode two. Um, And yeah, that they are, your your points are just, I can't say it any better. I mean, I think that uh, it is enjoyable as a, a viewer to, to go on this journey with them. Yeah. Also, just a cute side note. I love that he kept her little ballet slipper, and I love that she kept the sweater mm-hmm. or the yeah the sweatshirt. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 Oh, However, yeah. if I was Tyrone, I would be pissed because that was his brother's. So. <laughs> 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 I would be really upset about. Yeah. That. Yeah. Like, and I. <laughs> I like how you're we're introduced to the fact that she sleeps in that pretty much every night because that's her safety net. And there's again more about them as characters and cloak and dagger. Like that's just perfect foreshadowing. Yeah. Um. And then, but you don't see the ballet slipper until like what episode two? I feel like it was, it was late in yeah. episode one. Late in episode, oh right, he goes back to his room after, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was late in episode one. Yeah, the ending of episode two is when car accident. What I'm really confused about is, like, in the beginning of episode two, you see the still, like, after the car accident happens, and then there's all these little lightning bugs that are flying around, Mm -hmm. and I want to know what that's about. Like, do the lightning bugs heal her, and that's how she survives the horrific car like what is happening with the lightning bugs i feel like i see i saw the lightning bugs before and i felt like they were kind of a part of the explosion in a way like yeah. i feel like i i saw them appear in other places on the show i think you're right hmm. go back and watch I need, I need to go back and watch I, I agree with you i already got the powers that was okay i you know another scene i love is when Tyrone wakes up on the top of that building and he has the his bed sheet mm-hmm. and they pan away and Roxon Corp yep. sign is right next door and like that's just that, that shot was just straight from the comic books and they <laughs> do it on TV I love it yeah. I, I love that so much yeah I, you know I will say that um, really you know with this show and I know I think it was um, I think it was first commissioned in 2016, and it took them a while to, to come around and develop it. But you know, I will say that between this show and Krypton and Tick and Black Lightning, these, the last three like superhero shows have learned what works well and what doesn't work when you when you put together these types of types of shows. Because I think so, you know, so far, I think our general consensus is. We, we, we like all three. Uh, I can't speak for you, Patricia. I know Sarah and I definitely do. Um, uh, and taking the best elements of like all the things that have come up to this point, and especially in a very crowded universe of, of, mm-hmm. of, of superhero shows, but they've done things to make these new shows stand out in, 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 in a way to, like with this show, you know, and the same with Black Lightning, how to interweave, interweave social issues into into these shows in, in a way that's yeah. not overly preachy, uh, very very grounded in, in how they do it, uh, and also the same with the gifted too. Um, and 
And then um, Krypton is just good as far as like not making the mistakes of the prequels. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 end Krypton and we still can't help but talk about Krypton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how much of that show impacted me. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're still not over that season no, finale. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're you're right, and it's not just that they took like the best of everything that has come up before, but they've also created these new worlds and these new narratives that are similar yet very distinct and in their own genres of their in their own right. I mean, yeah. Krypton and, and Cloak and Dagger live on two very different worlds in two very different galaxies and could not be genre wise more different, yet because of the superhero elements, I feel like that's why we see a lot of the parallels, especially in terms of the share Shakespearean yeah. um motifs in both of the writing. Yeah. And also, I like the fact this show also reminds me of the gifted in the sense that early on in the gifted, our our here our the you know the, the uh, kids did not fully they knew they're about their powers but they they held them back. Here, mm-hmm. it, you know, this show again is doing a good job of you know as uh, we as an audience are, are going along with them as they are starting to discover their powers, which clearly did not manifest themselves. I mean, it happened obviously that night where they were able. Uh, rescue each other and, and end up on the beach. But it seems that up until this point, they've been dormant. They didn't know about them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, there, There's going to be more to reveal about that. There, yeah. There's something about how, however they end up revealing what the true connection is between those two and how it is associated with their powers. Yeah. There's going to be some kind of being gang, but. And I, and I wonder if that, you know, that moment when she stole his wallet at the party and, you know, he's chasing her down, if that was when they finally did, you know, cause they both like, he grabbed onto her or whatever and, you know, boom, they, they, they both have that spark. Um, right. And maybe that was the thing that, you know, re, you know, not only reestablished that connection that they have from that night, but, you know, figuratively and, and literally, but, uh, also, literal former powers that they that they've had, you know. From well, that time. well, it's it's interesting because in the books, he needs her light mm-hmm. to survive, essentially, right? Yeah. And then she she actually, and this is where I thought they were going with it. She every time she um, the more she goes on without using her powers, the more she does go a little bit cuckoo and starts having these really weird visions and dreams and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right. You're right. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, again, they are very interconnected. So speaking about interconnected fun fact about, um, Cloak, he totally took down Thanos, Thanos in the books. And I really wish he was in infinity war <laughs> after I realized that, um, that's my new fan fiction. Anyways, <laughs> uh, Patricia, you brought up Detective O'Reilly. Do you, um, what are your thoughts on Father Del- Delgado, who's the priest in Tyrone's school? Well, I don't, like, there's not a whole lot to go on, except for mm-hmm. that, you know, he was, you know, giving advice to Tyrone. I don't know if that was, like, supposed to be kind of a, Sort of a therapy session or just a discussion with him and a priest to talk about his anger or any issues. But, I mean, it'll be interesting how they integrate him into the story. If Tyrone is going to be embracing all of this anger and he wants to poison the same person that poisoned him. And it seems like. I mean, at the end of episode two, he's really embraced the darkness side of himself. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the priest has to say after this event. But, I don't know, he's, he's a priest. He seems like he's trying to be a good role model for someone that's going through a difficult time. Um, I feel like I've seen him in other things. Not just this show, like he's been in other TV shows, but, 
Yeah, that's all I got about the priest, really. So what happened in the grocery store? Like, he was in line, and he had bread. Yeah. And you could tell there was somebody ahead of him who I don't know if she goes to the church, and that's why he had the loaf of bread. But as soon as she's gone, he, like, drops the bread. And does he order liquor? Yeah. Yeah, he ordered liquor. Okay. I forgot about that scene. Well, I think. Well, I mean, I think he goes to, you know, everybody in this show are are dealing with some kind of, you know, he's dealing with personal people. I see what you did there. I like it. Um, And (laughs) (laughs) it is, you know, even, you know, our heroes are are, are both troubled people and everyone around them has, you know, I think the priest was, you know, talking about the poison and the anger and that kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. he's trying to be the, you know, the mentor. You know, there's always like there's a mentor for the heroes in these, in these shows. And, but, but like, the so like Gamby, <laughs> to bring in another show, <laughs> uh, they're very flawed characters and they have their own things that they're dealing with. And so, whether or not Tyrone finds out that, you know, Father Delgado is like, yeah, I, I think it just gives more texture to, to the, to, to what we're dealing with. And, and, and it's very, and it falls right into the theme of the show. It, it, this is not going to be, uh, you know, ABC family <laughs> light hearted thing. I mean, they are going to be touching mm-hmm. on some very hard, hard stuff as, as part of this new branded freeform network. I was, I was just about to correct you. I was just about to jump in and be like, there's no ABC family. This is freeform. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, I, I've seen other freeform shows, especially the shows that transferred from ABC family to freeform yeah. and how those, those are kind of like, I don't recall those type of shows when I was a teenager, but okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's just, it's, it's interesting how both both him and I feel like in that conversation he had with Tyrone, they they were at one point talking about alcohol. I couldn't, I wasn't exactly sure. And he's also got a lot of tattoos. Yeah. Um, which was very interesting. Um, I don't know if that's the most priestly thing. So it'll be cool to see the more we learn about him and how it kind of parallels what Tyrone is going through now and his own choices that he's having to make at such a young age that could potentially affect where he ends up in life. Yeah. And then on the flip side, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, finish it off. No, I was just going to say that on the flip side, we have Tandy's mom, who is another very damaged individual. That moment when Tandy realizes that she took all the money and all of her pills and just wasted it on this guy who's just using her and that broken heart. Now I will say it was not the same as shameless season four. There, there's a moment that's very similar to what happened. And I have to say shameless did it better, but still it resonated. Anyway, you go on. Now I'll just take it back to the priest a little bit and uh, just the imagery that uh, we've had in the show and touched on touched on a little bit earlier how Tandy lives in the church and you know, Tyrone's in a, uh, you know, the parochial school. Uh, but maybe, you know, they were talking about his tattoos and it's just the duality of... Right. Uh, well, I've noticed with a lot of characters throughout multiple different TV shows, if they're a priest, like, there was an episode on Lucifer where the priest was, you know, his backstory was a lot harder than you would think a typical priest is, but that's what seems to be a driving factor for people to become priests or to become close to God or become a a facilitator of the word of God is because they've had such difficult times themselves. They feel like they can be an advocate and aid other people with those sort of issues that they have in their life. And so it's not, I don't think it really fazed me that he had, like, I don't even remember that he had tattoos. The only thing I really remember was that he was changing from, like, street clothes into his priest clothes to be able to start school, and he was putting on the little neck thing that they, I don't know what those are called, but 
I know that sort of stood out to me was that he was changing during this conversation with Tyrone from being a street in his street clothes to his official robes Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I think if you're looking at the symbolism of that is that he's, you know, he's got his own past and he's trying to be better and, it's not perfect, but he's trying. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what Tyrone is going through. Like this idea of on what everybody sees is perfect and safe and comfortable, but the experience of that family and the loss that they've had to endure with his brother's death is, has a lot of cracks in, in, um, the family and his relationships with his parents and has and has changed those as and his own relationship with himself because of the guilt he carries. And I think that's that's really made sense where a kid who's going through all of that, who's trying to do everything right. And then his teammates turn on him for the most stupid reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stupid coach should have been the one to get the bat. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Um, and then he, he just gets fed up with it and he's like, no, I'm going to go get my revenge because I don't deserve all of this, but I know who does and I'm going to try. And I like how he, he, he goes after that. He makes that decision, but he does fail in it. He fails doing what he set out to do and he just finds himself face to face with Tandy again. Yeah. Go figure. Go figure. <laughs> Right. Right when she's trying to leave, like she's she's getting out of town, getting out of Dodge. And he he suddenly appears to stop her. Um. Well, this is going to we can't wait. I can't wait to continue this discussion next week for yeah, sure. For sure. Uh, Patricia, uh, you also watched. The finale episode of Sense8. Do you want to give us a rundown of what happened and your final oh, thoughts on that show? Absolutely. Um, so I've been a major fan of Sense8. And just to recap for people, um, last year at the end of May, they dropped season two. And then like two days later, on like the first day of you know, gay pride month, they canceled it. So everybody was pissed and there was petitions and there was phone calls to Netflix and the internet exploded. And so they finally gave in and decided to come back with a two and a half hour um, movie slash TV show to sort of sum up everybody's storylines and, you know, give everybody, you know, some sort of conclusion because where they left it off on season two was that one of the main sense eights was captured by BPO, which is the bad group that was doing research science and dissecting people and hunting down the sense eights. And one of them was captured and was being held hostage. And that's where you get left. And that's where they had canceled the show. So that's why everybody was so upset. Um, in summary, all in all, I am super happy that they came back with the two and a half hour show. I think with what they had to deal with and for it being a let's finish out the storylines and sum it up so that way, you know, they can move on to their Matrix films or whatever they're working on. Um, they did a really nice job. I wasn't disappointed with it. <laughs> If that makes sense. Cause sometimes when TV shows come back for like a final episode, it, you're either not satisfied with what they give you or it's complete crap. And this was none of those things. It was beautifully filmed that was consistent with the other two seasons, the filming, the characters, the feeling of the show, the themes of the show were all still there and Everything that happened was just so emotional. And I cried probably like four different times in two and a half hours. And I'm not talking like one little tear. I'm talking about bawling my eyes out at the TV. I was so 
So um, that's just sort of a summary of like where I was at when I started and how I overall <laughs> feel <laughs> about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't you judge me, Sarah. Don't I'm you not judge judging me. you. I'm just <laughs> way to blame you. <laughs> I just thought I would talk about a couple of the things that I really enjoyed. Um, there, so there's a relationship that sort of is happening between um, Kala and a guy named Wolfgang, and they're both sensei. And Kala is married, and so it's really interesting to see how she, because for all of season two, she was talking about divorcing her husband and running away with Wolfgang and, you know, starting a whole new life. And then you find out that her husband is being, is helping with an investigation with the FBI to look into stuff. And so he, his character grows and has this depth to it that causes Kala to like second guess herself because she really does love the man that she married. It's just that this underlayer of this sensate connection to this other man, Wolfgang, is really confusing her. The relationship between Wolfgang and Kala is beautiful, but it's not real in a way because they're not actually together. And in this season finale thing, she they end up saving Wolfgang from the BPO people, and she ends up explaining to her real life husband that, you know, this is everything that's going on with me. And she tells him the whole truth. And he is like mind blown, but he like takes it in stride and wants to help her with anything that he can. And he ends up, you know, shooting guns and like beating someone up because they were going to shoot Wolfgang. And like, it becomes this like weird trio of a relationship between the three of them. and. It's it was wonderful to watch and it was very cool how they did it and I was really happy with the way that it came out. Um one of the other very cool moments is that there are other sense eight people that you get to meet um through it and it was mostly in um season two. Um Riley, one of the sense eights that we're watching all the time, is she gains this connection to a gentleman named Mr. Hoy and he's running away from BPO agents and he connects with Riley to tell, to tell her what's going on. And this woman that was married to one of his sensates ends up saving his life and essentially, and they have this really awesome moment about, you know, she had always known that he was actually a sensate and it was very cool. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about because you guys haven't seen it yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, seriously, Patricia, spoiler alert. Like, you ruined it. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm trying not to give away. Um, it's okay. It's okay. The, the final big moment that I will talk about though is Nomi and Amanita's wedding. It's Nomi is a character who's trans and she has gone through, um, a sex change surgery and that happens at like the very beginning of season one you get to see that sort of unfold and she meets this woman Amanita and their relationship has endured both seasons and this whole season finale and they finally get married and they get married on one of the levels of the Eiffel Tower in Paris and it's absolutely beautiful and their vows to each other encompass what this show is about like Amanita gives a speech about having feelings and wanting to hold on to them, like the good feelings and having, you know, these deep connective ideas and possibilities with another human being. And that just encompasses the whole theme of the story and the show and why people are so into the show is because of that, that idea of being connected as a human to another human on a whole different level. And because they do it not so much as a supernatural thing, like with all the Marvel TV shows and things like that, you know, you get superpowers and people that have all these different abilities. This is more human, but it's more than being a human. Um, 
that's my gush, my gushing session on, on Sense8. So that was yeah. the gush session and, um, Sense8 is over and Patricia now has to rejoin the rest of us and <laughs> weekly watch shows for a change. And, um, yeah. welcome back to the world. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's good to be back. Honestly, well, it's great. Yeah. Well, you know, many times shows get canceled, and we never have the opportunity for us to you know, close out storylines, and and also, uh, you know, so kudos to all the Sensei fans for uh, petitioning Netflix uh, to give you give you a proper finale. Because so yeah. often, so often we, we don't get that, and you, you know, you guys are fortunate enough to. Yeah, and it the the show in itself. If, if listeners are listening to this, just just go watch it. It's it's filmed in all different eight parts of all the worlds. They 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 travel and they're on site at these places. And it's so expensive to create a show like this, but it's just absolutely phenomenally filmed. And the way that they do the transitions is flawless. And it's it's really sad that they canceled it, but you're right, Will. I am as such a big a fan as I am. We are so lucky. Out of all the TV shows that I could probably list off right now, this is the only one where they actually came back to finish things out completely. And it's very relieving. <laughs> like I feel like this weight is off my chest because I can, I can now definitively know what happened yeah um and when you do go watch sensei be sure to tweet at patricia and patricia can you tell the listeners where they can find you you can find me at pr miller 20 that's p-r-m-i-l-l-e-r two zero oh okay so we are going to stop for a few minutes and when we return, we're going to do a quick recap of Supergirl, if Sarah can remember it. Rising from the depths of a state called Michigan, two inebriated dorks prepare their plan for intergalactic domination. Mixing their extensive knowledge of beat culture with their insatiable thirst for alcohol, these two man-children bring you a show like you've never heard before. They will tell you tales from faraway lands and have you questioning their taste in beer. But make no mistake, friend, for the best coverage of your favorite comics, films, and TV shows, there's no better source for you to get your fix. So listen up, strap in, and prepare yourself as Jake and Tom conquer the world. And we're back, and I am going to cover Supergirl out of protest. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm kind of over it, Will. I'm very much just very confused anytime I realize another episode has dropped. And at this point, I just need Lena to realize that Kara is Supergirl, and James has been lying to her. And for that relationship to quickly deteriorate and for Lena to be set up as the next super villain. Yeah. That's yeah, it. That's it. That's the show. <laughs> but I, I, I get what you're saying. I will freely admit, uh, you know, we, we talked about this, uh, during our pre-show and, and I think we should, uh, you know, share this thought with our, with our audience. But I, they probably agree with us that Supergirl, unfortunately, had the, the bad luck of uh, some poor scheduling, and mm-hmm. I, and, I, and I think, I mean, some of it, if I recall from a few months ago, some of it was just some production delay that uh, caused them to, to get behind schedule while shooting, which, uh, which then led to um, the show going in, in, into June. Which, that being said, I think part of the problem I'm finding is that it, it's it's suffering from the curse of the padding of the of the season where yeah. where you 
you get these episodes that, uh, you know, in and of themselves, it, it could really be consolidated into maybe one show instead of spread out over two or three. I think of the most of the last three weeks, the the most probably one of the more compelling shows has been James being out at, at Guardian. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. That's out of the past three. That was my favorite episode. Yeah, um, I think uh, you know just several things there. Um, as we you know, we talked earlier in the episode tonight uh, about social commentary and uh, you know, taking on social issues, and and one of the things that stands out for me. And from that episode, quite frankly, is uh, how you know James talked about when he was seven years old, and you know was on vacation with his family, and you know gets stopped by the police, and you know he's just a little kid, and you get you get handcuffed, and mm-hmm. um, and how that um, you know really you know, really drives him in, in his his, his um, you know, role as guardian now. Uh, and, and he tells um, Lena, not Lena, yeah, Lena, about how really you know drives him to, to do what he does, and uh, and I thought that was a very powerful moment. Contrast that with what we had past week with the uh, whole gun control debate, which which you know no matter how you fall on on those issues, I will say that uh, this past week's episode felt almost clunky. And its execution of trying to take on social issues um, in, in a way that, um, uh, no matter how you fall on the issue, no one could, go, could come away from from that that episode feeling good about how it was executed. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm just like I'm glad you brought that up because I it's been a while since I've watched that episode, and I agree. Now that I remember that it was very clumpy clunky with how it executed that storyline and it's just been clunky because Kara finds out that her her people and her mom are still alive and they're living on this other side of the moon and there's something so so strained about how that came about that I was just like well that's convenient yeah and and now they're setting it up to where John for the last half of the season has been dealing with his his dad reconnecting with his father only to realize that his father will will soon pass away and time is very their time together is going to be very short lived and uh, I envision the finale where both Kara and John have to say goodbye to their parents who they just found and reconnected with in a very bittersweet way um and and so so i've already finished the season i'm moving on (laughs) for season four i could care less about rain these days um i think it's kind of annoying how one moment she's sam one moment she's rain when it's convenient they feel like they won and then rain comes out again it's just like oh whatever yeah watch Trent Rich repeat I, I will say it, it's, it, you know, getting back as we love seems to be our, our fallback these days to tie anything related to the House of L to back to Krypton. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, um, it was, uh, fun seeing the, uh, uh Cobalt reappear and, yeah. um, the voice of Rao. Voice of Rao. Yeah. I know that's in the, uh, Krypton, but I can't remember. Is that what they also call it, Supergirl? I can't recall. Yes. Yeah. 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 May the um, may the grace of Rao be with you. Yeah. The vo- yeah, yeah. It's anytime they say Rao on Supergirl, I smile. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> same here now. Cause yeah, thank you Krypton for fully fleshing it out, so now we can appreciate it more on Supergirl. But um, yeah, you know, so it, 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 I'm glad they're finally pulling all those threads from the very beginning of the season together. Here at the end, they're building a new fortress of brow on uh, on uh, on Earth uh, after the last one was destroyed. Um, you know the the storyline on, on uh, Argos. It just seems that you know things are. They had to figure out a way to get Mono and Kara back together, and this was the the way they they went about it. And 
I, I, when I was watching it, these, these last two episodes in particular, I was really kind of bored with it. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it didn't, it was just very, again, very clunky and her, Typical. yeah, showing up back, you know, finding a way to, to leave all the things that are going on in, in National City and then, you know, they figure out they have to go get this rock. <laughs> and, and, and it just seems that creatively they just got to hit, hit a wall. Um, and they're just trying to figure out a way how to, how to work their way through the rest of the season. Um, and. Bonnell and Kara do, they did so much, they had such better chemistry in season two mm-hmm. that as a viewer, I, and I very much a fan of them. If, if, if you're a couple on TV and I have a fan vid of you on my channel, on my YouTube channel, you know I'm obsessed. And I've yep. made some ca- caramel videos. Yep. I'm very disappointed with season three, Car and Manel. Because Manel works best when he's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> when he's, and it's not even a jerk because even in season two, he, you could see the good guy in him yep. at moments. There was just something so, his his na- naiveness towards um, Earth and Earth culture allowed him to have humor, and his his history with Kara, where they come from these um, families who both despised one another and worlds that despised one another, and and all of that baggage, and how he was the first one from 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 a place where she was familiar with almost a home to her Mm -hmm. um, was very interesting. And then in season three, he comes back and he's very stoic and he's too much like Kara. Yes. Too much like Kara. Yes. And I don't like it. Yes. You're, you you nailed it. I think that's the problem. Um, You know, that tension and that, you know, they had in a way to create, to try to create the tension this time with him being married in the future. Yeah. And then they, you know, me, you know, then they've had to back, you know, walk that back. And, and now since that he is a lot like Kara, um, does dilute the, the spark in the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still Chris Wood, so I'm always going to watch, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and also talk about that dilution of the whole marriage and, and, I always call her by the wrong pat, um, planet, so I'm yeah. just going to say Emra. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, 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 I finally remember too. her name. Yeah. <laughs> um, why couldn't the writers have just shipped her back and kept Brainy? Because Brainy was one of the better parts of the second half of the season. Agreed. Agreed. Like, what the heck, guys? Come on, yeah. Miss Dr. Sunity? <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> yeah, I... You know, it's it's not that I'm glad the finale is near. Um and it's not that the season was awful. Like I don't resent the season like I do season four of the flash or anything. I just right. feel like between everything that you previously mentioned, it, it, it's just it's it's June. Errol yeah. Earth's season is over. Yeah. This isn't the time. These shows do need to take place in a way where this is the world and the universe we're in. We're right now in hiatus season, guys. Yeah. We're watching new shows. We're mm-hmm. checking out new. Th- <laughs> yep. <laughs> Even though ratings was, it has been, you know, doing okay in its time, you know, in its time slot, but, uh, they're going to change that next season yeah, too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. Right. Right. It is what it is. Greg Bar- Berlanti is getting a $300 million contract deal for the next three years. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, I so. Yeah. Greg is not, yeah, he is not missing any mil anytime soon. And probably with that, more characters for him to play with and more soon a DC show every night of the week. Yeah. Yep. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. 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 Will, let's wrap it up. Where can listeners find you? Yes, you can find me at Will and Polk. That's W-I-L-L-M-P-O-L-K. And you can find me on Twitter at S-J-Melmont, S-J 
S-H-A-N-N-E-R-D-J-B-E-L-M-O-N-T. Please follow our crew on Twitter at Stain and Nerd. Friend us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. But most importantly, rate, subscribe, and comment on both iTunes and SoundCloud. And you can also find us on the iHeart Radio app. And you can also find us on Google Play Music. That's not, that doesn't have a good ring to it. Google Play Music. It's just, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Good night, geek out. You're welcome.